A young minister found a serious and unsettling problem in his new congregation. During the Sunday service, half the congregation stood for singing, while the other half remained seated. And each side shouted at each other, insisting that theirs was the true tradition. Nothing the minister said or did resolved this impasse. Finally, in desperation, the young pastor sought out the congregation's 99-year-old founder. He met the old minister in a nursing home and poured out his troubles. So tell me, he pleaded, was it the tradition of the church to stand during singing? And older pastor reflected and said, no. Ah, so then it was the tradition to be seated during singing. The pastor thought for a moment and said, no. Well, what we have now is complete chaos, the younger pastor responded. Half the congregation stands and shouts, the other half sits and screams. Ah, said the older pastor, that was the tradition. <laughs> Traditions and our reading from Luke have something in common. Let's take a look. Christmas is a season for traditions, isn't it? Maybe we grew up with some of those Christmas rituals ourselves. I'd like your help this morning in sharing some of your family traditions so that your voice and experience might become part of our learning this day. For your family, what's the soonest that the Christmas tree can be put up? Day after Thanksgiving, do I have other contenders? Halloween. November. November 1st. Day before Christmas. <laughs> and what's the latest you can take down the Christmas tree? January 6th. Do I have other? Epiphany? Anybody else? The latest you can take it down. December 26th, the day after Christmas. Easter. <laughs> we each, uh, show of hands, uh, how many of us have some decorations from our own childhood that get placed faithfully on the Christmas tree each year? We each have a list of traditions we've grown up with and have internalized over time. I'd like your help this morning in sharing some of that. Uh, by completing this sentence, it just isn't Christmas until I've, it just isn't Christmas until I've eaten everything. <laughs> Can't go wrong with that. It, mom's cookies. It just isn't Christmas until I've sung. Ah. It just isn't Christmas until I've heard. What's that? Christmas music. The Messiah. It just isn't Christmas until I've smelled. There are certain smells associated with Christmas. Cookies, again. What's that? Pine trees. Peppermint. Ah. It just isn't Christmas until I've spoken with family. Just isn't Christmas until I've seen Christmas lights, family. It's a wonderful life. It just isn't Christmas until I've gathered at church, Christmas Eve service, grandma's. What's that? Around the piano. It just isn't Christmas until I've touched. Snow? Okay. It just isn't Christmas until I've received. Present. <laughs> it just isn't Christmas until I've cooked. Maybe there's a certain thing you cook. Turkey. What's that? 
poppy seed and nut rolls, which are quite delicious. It just isn't Christmas until I've baked cookies. <laughs> it just isn't Christmas until I've sent Christmas cards. It just isn't Christmas until I've opened presents. <laughs> Just as a Christmas till I've gone to, maybe a certain place. Church, I hear. Just as a Christmas till I've watched. Now this one may. Christmas story. <laughs> Rudolph. It just isn't Christmas till I've given. Gifts. What's that? <laughs> Each of us individually has our own Christmas traditions, ones we've inherited from our parents and others. And because as children those traditions get imprinted upon our memories so deeply, it's fun when we meet others to discover that they celebrate the holiday differently than us. And when two people are married, they weave those separate traditions into a new pattern. <laughs> My family's tradition was you didn't open any presents until the 25th proper. My wife's tr family's tradition was you could open one present on the 24th. We had negotiated a working compromise that was doing well and then had our daughter born on Christmas Day. <laughs> New traditions. We've all grown up with Christmas rituals and traditions. We each celebrate them in different ways. It was into Judaism's traditions and rituals that Jesus was born. As familiar as Christmas traditions are to us, Jewish traditions would have been to him. Their particular understanding of time with its holidays and remembrances and observances was his heritage. Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, Hanukkah, Purim, Pesach, Shavuot, and Shabbat were the time frame and traditions within which Jesus lived. Luke takes great care in placing Jesus' story within the larger story of Israel so that his life was in continuity with all who had preceded him. That's part of the reason for the genealogy that Luke provides. Tracing Jesus' lineage back through David, Jacob, Isaac, Abraham, Noah, and Adam. Jesus is descended from the worthies throughout Israel's history all the way back to creation itself. We see Jesus firmly ensconced within that religious tradition because in today's reading we heard after eight days had passed, it was time to circumcise the child and he was called Jesus. Circumcision signified that Jesus was a member of the people of Israel, a descendant of Abraham. By being circumcised on the eighth day, he was forever marked with a sign of God's covenant. And Joseph and Mary were promising that their son would live under the law's commands. Only those circumcised on the eighth day could claim to have unblemished Jewish credentials. Circumcision is just one of the time-honored traditions in this verse, for by Joseph naming him Jesus, he adopts him into his own lineage and makes him a descendant of David. Jesus becomes a son of David through Joseph naming him. Yet there are other time-honored traditions we see his parents engage in, ones that happen 40 days after his birth. Mary and Joseph go to the temple in Jerusalem for two separate rituals, the purification of Mary and the redemption of Jesus both required by the law of Moses. Because the power of blood during childbirth had rendered Mary unclean, 
unable to touch anything sacred or enter the temple, a purification offering would be necessary before she could re-enter society. While there for the purification, Jesus' parents also dedicated him to the Lord, offering a sacrifice of pigeons to buy him back. This is another significant tradition in which the firstborn son was bought back from the Lord to whom he belonged in recognition of the first Passover in which the firstborn sons of Israel were spared by door lentils being smeared with lamb's blood. The law required the price of a lamb to be offered for the life of a firstborn son, but had a poverty clause that said pigeons would suffice for the poor. Jesus, although poor, is a son of Moses through being presented in the temple. Jesus is a descendant of Abraham through circumcision, a descendant of David through naming, and a descendant of Moses through being presented to the Lord. Luke takes great care in placing Jesus' story within the larger story of Israel, saying Joseph and Mary finished everything according to the law of the Lord. Jesus, from the beginning of his life, is through observant parents and time-honored traditions given unblemished Jewish credentials. His life is continuous with the story of Israel. Into this traditional setting, among scores of other parents with children, there's a holy interruption. Like an ancient pediatric waiting room with squalling children and tired parents, something unsettling and extraordinary happens. Two figures, a man and woman, Simeon and Anna, appear. They are both advanced in years, both righteous and devout, both looking forward to the consolation of Israel and the redemption of Jerusalem. Simeon was someone upon whom the Holy Spirit rested, to whom the Holy Spirit had promised that he would not die before seeing the Messiah, and guided by that spirit, he comes to the temple. Anna was a widow who worshipped in the temple, fasting and praying night and day. Simeon was a priest, and Anna a prophet. Two very traditional roles in Israel. Simeon blessed baby Jesus and praised God for keeping his promise. Simeon then blessed Joseph and Mary and spoke directly about, to Mary about Jesus and her own future. As soon as Simeon had finished speaking at that moment, Anna came and praised God, speaking to all to, about the child who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. Simeon sought the consolation of Israel and inspired by the Holy Spirit, said that Jesus would be for glory to your people Israel. Mary and Joseph were in the center of Jewish faith, in the temple of Jerusalem, presenting their son for dedication. And they were amazed at what was being said about him. Amazed because the consolation of Israel and redemption of Jerusalem were promises God made through Isaiah, promising salvation to the people of Israel. And yet, now those promises broaden to include a light for revelation to the Gentiles too. What child is this? Mary and Joseph wonder. This child won't be just for his own people, but for all people. A traditional ritual and customary occurrence becomes the setting for unsettling and extraordinary grace. 
the Messiah isn't just for Jews, but for Gentiles too. No wonder Mary and Joseph were amazed. A holy interruption. Something unsettling occurs in the temple. What began with tradition ended with transformation. In Protestant circles, tradition and ritual have gotten a bum rap. As inheritors of Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, and many others, we have to a greater or lesser degree protested against the beliefs and practices of our Catholic sisters and brothers. We range all the way from the high church liturgy of Episcopalians in cathedrals with organ and robed choirs and incense all the way to the low church liturgy of Quakers in meeting houses sitting in silence until the spirit prompts. Most of us, I suspect, fall somewhere in the middle between these two. We seek to embrace tradition without traditionalism. For as church historian Yaroslav Pelikan notes, tradition is the living faith of the dead, while traditionalism is the dead faith of the living. Tradition connects us with those people in the past in a vital, life-giving way. When our rituals are grounded in tradition, they are life-giving. On the other hand, traditionalism is simply going through the motions. If I go to church this many times and go to the communion table, this many times, say my daily prayers, and read my daily scriptures, and go through the same motions as my ancestors did, then I'll be connected to God. Our disciples of Christ founders who called themselves reformers launched a movement that has created its own traditions. Disciple congregations have organs and other musical instruments, while our cousins in the movement do not. Women serve as deacons, elders, and pastors among disciples, whereas only men serve in positions of authority in other branches of the Stone Campbell movement. Fifty years ago, most disciple churches had communion first, then the sermon. Fifty years ago, we'd be hard-pressed to find a disciple church with Christ candles and Advent wreaths and communion tablecloths that change color with the changing of the church year. We disciples have traditions, but we're open to being led by the Spirit as we engage in conversations with other churches more experienced liturgically than ours. Ours is an unsettled faith. One not easily captured in a pretty bow with a box as well. One of my Catholic friends, after lengthy conversations, asked me, but what do you believe? It's not spelled out. And I replied, look at how we practice our faith. It speaks volumes. Our weekly communion table is open. We baptize by immersion, and we gather as people who expect God to continue working among us. We don't have everything nailed down. That's right, but we think that's a good thing. Ours is an unsettled faith, but one that leaves openings for the Spirit to guide us as Simeon was. Ours is an unsettled faith, but one open to innovation and experimentation that continues being expressed in congregations far and wide. To be a living faith, one that grows and adapts, 
requires us to be unsettled. We understand that no human institution or creed can ever capture the fullness of God's revelation in Jesus Christ. This word of God in Jesus Christ alone is absolute, but our understanding of it is never absolute or final. Jesus Christ, not some particular institution or creed, is the living Lord of the church. The good confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, Lord and Savior, is enough to begin a life of faith. Such a confession requires elaboration, which means by necessity we'll be unsettled in our faith, unsettled and growing. For although every day holds the possibility for our eyes being open to God's presence in powerful ways, most of us, let's be honest, don't have the attention span to notice it. That's why we have seasons of holiness, Advent, Christmas, Epiphany, Lent, Easter, to focus our attention and wake us up. They are times of tradition and rich with ritual. Traditions at their best are tools for our transformation. Rituals at their root are resources for renewal. What's essential is not mistaking traditionalism for tradition, of not confusing ritual with the reality it points to. What if? What if we started a new holiday tradition that we see through the rituals of the season to a deeper and greater and richer reality? What if rote rituals instead readied us for renewal? What if tired traditions instead pointed us to transformation? Putting up a tree doesn't make us holy, but it does point to a God who hung on a tree. Placing an angel at the top of the tree doesn't make us holy, but it points to a God at whose birth the angel sang. Stringing up lights doesn't make us holy, but it points to the one who is a light for revelation, even to us Gentiles. Giving gifts doesn't make us holy, but it points to a God who gave the gift of his only begotten son, traveling great distances over the holidays does not make us holy, but points to a God who traveled the greatest distance from heaven to earth in order to make us holy. Living with our eyes open in such a way would be unsettling, but faithful. And who knows, living this way might cause us to become a holy interruption in this hectic holiday season so that we might point others who are seeking consolation and redemption to the son of David, the son of Moses, the son of Abraham, and the son of God. What if that became our new holiday tradition? Amen.